about it? Please get this uh, turned up a little bit. Thank you. That works. All right. Well, uh, I think of today and, and the, the word that comes to mind, which I think is one of the most beautiful uh, words in the Bible, is the word redemption. God is a redeemer, and uh, he looks at us through redemptive eyes, and uh, we, we all uh, who have experienced the grace of Jesus in our lives have experienced that redemption, and there are redemption songs today and redemption testimonies. Well, it's uh, been such a privilege over the years to partner with Redwood Teen Challenge, and now Redwood Teen and Adult uh, Challenge. Uh, it's always had a very very strong presence and ministry here along the Redwood Coast, but uh, over recent years, uh, a new leader uh, emerged, and that is Tom Throssel. Uh, we were privileged to partner with Tom and his family while they were missionaries uh, down in Bolivia, and uh, they came back up here, and uh, God uh, navigated their lives uh, to uh, invest themselves in their this powerful uh, ministry that's taking place here uh, in, in Humboldt. And uh, those of us here at Arcata First Baptist Church, many of us know Tom and Janine. Uh, Tom is just such a man of integrity. He's a man of God. He has such an affable personality and carries a, a, a real silent confidence uh, in the Lord uh, about him. And we just uh, respect you so much. Tom. Uh, we admire you, and uh, you've just taken this ministry to, to new heights and new dimensions, and it's just exciting uh, for us to see what God's doing in you and through you and through these uh, amazing young men and older men and women of God. And so let's uh, give Tom a warm Arcata First Baptist Church welcome. You can leave that there. All right. I know, where else can I go? I bring my own cheering squad, right? Well, it is good to be here. Um, I really had uh, grown a lot of roots. My, my, my uh, travels in faith um, began here, and um, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to you all this morning. And I asked Pastor Dennis what he wanted me to speak on, and he said something about missions. And so you're going to get a message this morning about something about missions. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, I just need your help this morning to clearly articulate what you have, what word you have for each and every individual you'll hear this morning. I pray you would use me in a way that uh, people would hear you and not me. Help me not to be a distraction. And I just pray the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Well, a couple years back, um, our family went on a went to a concert, and afterwards we had the opportunity to meet the artist. He was a famous Christian musician, and uh, my younger son, Philip, um, wanted to talk to this guy, so we went up to him, and Philip said, what would you say to a young person who wants to be a musician? What advice would you give to me? And he said, I don't know how good you are, but you're not good enough. He said, you need to practice more. I thought, well... I wasn't really excited about his advice, but I thought, it's valid, you know, you probably need, everybody needs to practice more, right? So a couple months later, we went to another concert, and same thing happened. Philip wanted to go backstage, he met this famous Christian artist, and he said, what's your advice for a young person that wants to get into the Christian music industry? And I remember what he said, he said, work on your character. And I thought, that's pretty good advice because whether you're a musician or no matter what your job is, um, character is important. And I, I was kind of impressed with the second guy that, that he would have the mindset to tell my son, work on your character, not on the music. And so as, uh, as I began to prepare something for you today, I, I want to pretend you are asking me the question, what advice would you have for somebody who's interested in missions? I'm a young person. What would your advice be if I wanted to get involved in missions? So this was my uh, answer. Um, 
I think I could talk about education. When I first went to Bolivia, my first time, they said, come back after you have some education and some money and, uh, and a little bit more Christian education. So I had to get my mechanics license, go to Bible college and get money. It took us 10 years, right? I could talk to you about money. You know how important it is, missions, money, right? I could talk to you about education, how important it is to find a good quality Bible college to go to. But the truth of the matter is, I've, I've met a lot of missionaries, and I think the one thing that disqualifies more people from the mission field, more than finances, more than education, more than ability, uh, is character. And I think we have to go back there. And so this is what I wrote for you today. My advice for someone interested in missions would be this. Become a man or woman of purity today. Here at home, don't wait till tomorrow. Begin living a godly life today. Because if you're not doing it here and now, you won't do it there and then. Right? That's my message for today. And so my question is, who determines what pure is anyway? If I tell you that you should live a life of purity, that word came up this morning already. If you live a life of purity, who determines purity? When you tell your kids to go clean their room, eight minutes later they come back and they say, my room is clean. And what does mom say? No, it's not. <laughs> Who determines cleanliness and purity? Because in our society today, pure has a very different meaning than from what God intended. Right? The definition of purity can be a lot of different stuff. And so, it seems like some people don't even understand what I say when I say live a life of purity. Especially in our culture today. Right? Where everything is acceptable. And it runs opposite of what God says. So how can a young person say, stay pure? It's a valid question, right? And if you think about it, you might think, well, Tom, you're just bringing that up. You live in California. It's 2019. The world is more perverse than it's ever been. But this question, how can a young person stay pure, actually came to us more than 3,000 years ago in the book of Psalms. And so what I'd like you to do is, if you have your Bible with you, open up to Psalm 119. Right? Psalm 119, it should be the easiest psalm to find in the Bible because it's the longest one. Right? So this is what Psalm 119, we're going to start in verse 9 and go to verse um, 13, I think. 9 through 11. Psalm 119, verse 9, is how can a man or woman... Keep his way pure by keeping it according to your word. Verse 11, no, 10. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. And verse 11 may be familiar to you. Your word have I hid or treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. All right? Psalm 119 is a fascinating chapter in the Bible to study. If you're looking for something to study in the Bible, I would encourage you tonight, go home and open up Psalm 119. I don't know if you realize this, but Psalm 119 is written as an acrostic, right? So if you look at verse 1, it has the, the Hebrew word Aleph right there at the beginning. And then where we started in verse 9, it has the word, the letter Beth. Can you see that? So you might be wondering who's Beth, right? <laughs> Beth is the second letter of the alphabet. And basically what the psalmist does is he writes a series of verses with the first letter of the alphabet. Another section with the second letter. And they go through the whole alphabet. And because we have English, we don't really have that ability to look into it that way. Unless you speak Hebrew, you, know, you wouldn't even know that this is happening. So I, I got a friend here. I don't even see him. We're Steve Fetters. Right in the back here. So Steve and his wife Joyce are expecting a baby, and they're doing a baby shower today. And I, I can envision Steve in maybe uh, four or five months opening up a Dr. Seuss book and sitting with his young little son on his lap, and he will read the book, Big A, Little A, What Begins with A? Aunt Annie's Alligator, A-A-A. Big B, Little B, What Begins with B? Uh, baby Bubbles Bumblebee, BBB. B, B. How many of you read books like that to your children when they were young? I remember, Steve, you're going to memorize whole books. 
But in the same way Dr. Seuss wrote a whole book about the alphabet, that's what Psalm 119 is. And the part we're, sec we're reading is the part that starts with the letter B, Beth. Are you with me? That's what this whole thing is. And if you don't do the research and study it, you don't even realize it because in English they t it does, it's not the same words. Right? I had fun with this chapter. This is a great chapter and a great section. And so I started looking up the word Beth. So you think about it, where do you hear the word Beth? You think of like Bethel, Bethel, right? You guys have heard of Bethel Church? Beth meaning house of, El meaning God. Bethel is the house of God. Bethlehem is the house of bread. And so some people say that the Beth in this section is really about how to prepare your heart to be a house of God. We don't know that for sure, but that's what some people believe. I think it's true because it really talks about preparing your heart to be a house of God. And so as you read through this, I think it's pretty exciting. And verse 9 says, how can a young person keep their way pure? And I think... The world tells us that as you're young, I don't know if you've ever heard this, you're young, go spread your wild oats. Go have fun while you're young, and then when you get older, then you can settle down and have a family and become responsible. Anybody ever hear that? Total horrible, worst advice you could ever give a young person today. Right? But it's true, we do that a lot. We tell people, now's the time. I've heard people say, go work on your testimony. Right? That's horrible, horrible advice. But that's the advice that we're giving young people today. Go mess up all you want now because when you're older then you can settle down. Completely contrary to the Word of God. Because God says, how can a young person start when you're young? How can a young person stay pure? Right? There are some things in life that you can't unsee. Ask any veteran who's dealing with PTSD. There are some things, no matter how much time, no matter how much therapy, no matter how much energy you put into getting over some of your hurts and hang-ups from when you were a youth, some of us still deal with those things 40, 50 years later. They still burned into our mind. And so if there are things that I can protect my children or my students from, from never seeing, I'm going to do it. And I would encourage you to start young. It's kind of interesting that this word way, it says, how can a person keep his way or his path pure? That word in the Hebrew is really like the path um, made in a road by a chariot. And it's almost kind of like a rut. Like, how can you keep your rut pure? How many of us have habits that we started when we were children that we still struggle with 20 years later? A lot of, we got a couple hands, a couple honest people out there. But think about it. How many ruts in our lives have we developed from an early age? And what if you could start a rut or a habit as a godly person in your life? You know, I love Ron Warner in the Christian school. My kids went to school there, and they're teaching them how to build a habit of reading the Bible and praying. Those habits stay with you for a lifetime, and you become an adult that has that habit. So I would encourage you, how can you keep your way pure? Start of it, part of it is starting young. I think that's why it says, how can a young person? You start when you're young. Don't wait till you're old, right? Let me see, I'm jumping all around here. I think that's part of the reason why every testimony is powerful. I mean, we heard three testimonies of people that ended up in a program because they needed help. But, and that's powerful. What has God taken you out of? Right? But the truth of the matter is, your testimony may not have jail or drugs or alcohol, but it's still powerful. Because to me, it's not what God brought you out of, but what God protected you from. That's a powerful testimony too. If you're a believer in Lord Jesus Christ, you have a powerful testimony. I don't care how radical it is. I don't care how many times you arrested. What God has done in your life is powerful. Don't ever forget that. Your testimony is valid and powerful. So, how can a young man keep his way pure? Maybe a better way to say it is how can a young man build ruts or habits that are pure? The second half of verse 9 says this, by living or keeping according to your word. Purity means living according to God's word. 
The, there's a couple different translations for this one word, living. We also hear the word guarding by guarding it or keeping it or observing it. A life of moral purity does not happen by accident. It's a choice. It's intentional. Character is a choice. And the natural path that you and I take is typically towards impurity and towards uh, g degeneration. How many of you had to teach your children how to sin? I don't see any hands raised. But how many of you had children that sinned? Right? Think about it. You don't have, I, my parents never taught me how to lie or how to steal. I learned that on my own. And I think typically those are things that if, you, if you're into the blame game, we'll just lay it out here right now. It's Adam's fault. Right? The Bible says that through one man sin entered the world and we have a sin nature. Right? And so if you want to blame somebody, it's Adam's fault. But we don't have to, to worry about um, teaching people to sin. It comes naturally. In the same way, if you have a piece of iron and you leave it out, it will automatically, through time and moisture, um, it'll turn back into rust and it eventually will disintegrate. And have you seen the, the red pickup out on Samoa Beach that somebody decided to leave out there? It is rusting away rather rapidly. And it is, it's natural for it to deteriorate and go back to where it came from. The same is true for you and I. Our natural tendency is to sin. And we have to work at that on a regular basis by living according to God's Word. Right? So if you had a nice car and you didn't want it to rust, what would you do? You wouldn't drive it on the beach. And you know if they salted the roads, if you live in a place where there's lots of ice and they salt the roads, you're going to keep your car washed. You might put it in a garage. You would protect it. You would change its environment to protect it. And I think the same is true with our Christian walk. That if you want to walk a Christian life, you have to change your environment. That if you are around the corrosive parts of life, you're, it's not going to go well. How, how many of our students have made a decision, I can't go home because I know where I've been, I know what's in that town, and I can't go home for a while because that environment is not healthy for me. So maybe at some point we change our environment. And the same is true with iron. We do that. And so in our Christian walk, you can protect yourself from eroding into the world around us by living a life and following the word of the Lord. So you might ask me, do you expect me to follow some antiquated book, some book of good stories that you found that, you know, do you, do you really expect me to, to follow some antique book? The truth of the matter is, yes, I do. Because to me, it's a lot more than just an antique book. This is God's love letter to me and to you. It's much more than just a, a, an old book of stories and a list of names that we can't pronounce and don't care about. <laughs> right? We live according to His Word. And so the Word has to be our standard. Because the truth of the matter is, how else are you and I going to determine what's right and wrong? I was talking to my son about this last night. How do you know what's right or wrong? Do you base it on what the world says is right or wrong? If that was true, then something that's wrong in California, you walk across an imaginary line into Nevada, it's now right. Right and wrong changes based on where you're at. Based on law, I mean, we all have laws that we know um, aren't right or wrong. And laws change all the time. Speed limit back in the 50s was much lower and it gets faster. Laws change. What do, where do you determine what your standard is? Does that make, is that a valid question? So to me, the word standard, for those of you who don't know, I'm an airplane mechanic by trade, and so I spent a lot of time with measuring tools. And so if you're going to rebuild an airplane engine, you have to use measuring tools. A lot of micrometers and gauge blocks and all that kind of stuff. And here's the truth. Every instrument that you have to measure something has to have a traceability to be able to trace it back to know that it's accurate, right? Because you don't really know if it's accurate. How do you know an inch is an inch? 
Well, you buy a tape measure. I mean, what if the guy running the printing press was a little bit off that day and your tape measure is a little bit off? True story. So back in the 1700s, they determined that they were going to use the kilogram as a basis for a measure. And so there was actually a gentleman who poured a piece of metal, and I wrote it down what it is. It's platinum, and it's an alloy cylinder. And they made one piece of metal in 1889 and said, this is the unit of measure. This is the standard for all kilograms in the world. So today, in the outskirts of uh, Paris, France, there is a, an organization that guards, that's their job, is to protect this weight that is exactly one kilogram. And if you have a scale that measures kilograms, you can trace it all the way back to that one weight that's inside this glass protected thing. And they said it's in a vault with three keys, something like you'd imagine in a movie. But it's the standard for all kilograms in the whole world today, this one weight, and it is exactly one kilogram. The reason I say this is because as our world changes and as laws change and as your friends change and as you change, the word of the God, the word of God can't, it doesn't change. It's the same as it was and it's the same as it is. And if you set your standards here, people can hate you for it, but you have something to blame. Right? And I know this, it's kind of a, I like the blame game a little bit when people say, well, you know, you're sexist or you're whatever you want to call me. I'm okay with that because that's what it says in the word of God. Don't blame me, blame God. It's his fault, right? So I found this, um, this Bible right here was given to me um, by my great aunt, my dad's uh, aunt. And my parents are actually here this morning. And uh, I thought this was cool. So this was a Bible given to me by my great aunt. And I opened it up and it says this. It says, to my, grand, to my dear grandson, William Throssell. William was my dad's grandfather. And it says, love Margaret Hutchcraft. So this wasn't my grandfather's Bible. This was my great grandfather's Bible given to him by his grandmother. And here's what I want to show you. Psalm 119, verse 9, 10 and 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereof according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against me. God's word doesn't change. And what he told my great great grandfather is what he's telling you today. And what's true for him is true for me. And so I would encourage you, get in the word. It's not going to change. And when the world changes around you, that's okay. Stick with it. And so as a young person, as an older person, hoping to get into missions, that's my one encouragement, is get in the word. It starts out, how can I keep my way pure? By walking according to your word. The next part says, I will seek you with my whole heart. And as I, as I struggled with like a, an analogy to tell you how to look for God with your whole heart, the only thing I could think of was this. God, I will look for you like my lost remote control. <laughs> Maybe like your lost cell phone. Have you ever lost your keys and you were like frantic and you're just like, why don't we ever search for God with that same enthusiasm, with that same like, I will find him. <laughs> And I hope that you do that with Psalm 119 this week. Go home and find God in Psalm 119. Dig and read everything you can about Psalm 119. Find everything out you can about God. In the same way that if you lost your cell phone, you're going to find it. And I'm going to keep calling it. I'm going to keep calling it until I find it. Right? I will seek you with all my heart. Seek God with all your heart. Here the, the psalmist declares his dedication to God. I'm going to seek you with all my heart. That's a pretty like firm, bold statement. I'm going to seek God with all my heart. And then he comes back with the second half of the verse. Don't let me stray from your commands. He's like, I'm bold. I can do this, but God help me. He's acknowledging his weakness and saying, God, don't let me get too far. Fence me in. Keep the leash short, God, because I need your help. Don't let me stray from your commands. Keep me close because I'm committed. 
But at the same time, I'm petrified, Lord. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Does that make sense? I mean, it's almost like he's, he's making two completely uh, contradictory statements together. I, I'm committed. I'm going to seek God with my whole heart. But please, God, don't let me stray too far. Keep me close. Have you ever had a friend that you said that to? I think you can only say that to people that you have a close relationship with. And as your relationship with people build, you can tell somebody, hey, I want you to keep me accountable. I mean, that's part of AA is you find a mentor, you find a sponsor who you say, if you see me drinking, you need to kick me in the head. You need to wake me up and get me back on track. And I think this is what the psalmist is telling God is, no matter what I do, reel me back in, keep me close. Hold me accountable for what I want to do. When I was in the Coast Guard, I lived on a ship in Alameda. And there was a friend of mine, a good one of my best friends in the Coast Guard, had a toxic relationship with this girl. And every time we went into port, he would go find her and they would go spend time together. And so one time he said, hey, Tom, I'm, this is really a bad relationship. I don't want to be in this relationship with her. But every time we come into port, I call her and we spend time together and it's not good. And he said, would you help hold me accountable? So we talked about it and I said, all right, I'll tell you what. Next time we go into port, if you go see her, we're going to throw you off the boat. <laughs> He's like, okay, I don't know why he agreed to it, but he agreed. Sure enough, we pulled into Alameda, and off he went, and he came back. And true to my, true to my uh, promise, we pushed him off the pier right into the water. And, you know, out of all the people, I expected him to get out, just be so mad. You got my wallet wet. You got my stuff. He came out, and he thanked me, and he said, I asked you to keep me accountable, and you did. And I appreciate that. And I think that that's what the psalmist is doing here. God, keep me accountable no matter what. Keep me close. Don't let me stray from your commands. And when you correct me, I'll be thankful. How many of you have ever been corrected by God because you did something wrong and when he did, you're mad at him? Can't believe you would do that to me. <laughs> But the reality is you're asking him to correct you. And so I would encourage you to be accountable to what God has for you. And when he does correct you, allow him to speak into your life and, and be humble and say, you know what? It's not really what I want, but this is what I need. I think that's what this whole section, this whole verse 10 is all about. Don't let me stray from your commands. The psalmist gave God the full right to speak in his life. Say, when you, say what you want, God. I'm all ears. I will listen. And I think it's all about surrendering to God your will. That when you surrender your will to God and he says, well, I don't want you doing that. I want you doing this. You're willing to say, whatever, you're, you're in charge. Not my will be done, but yours. So verse 11 says this. I have hidden your word in my heart. And I think a lot of people hide God's word somewhere else than in their heart. Right? So what does it mean to hide God's word in your heart? I love the, the New American Standard translation translates it. I have treasured your word. It's not just hidden to be forgotten, but you've got a map. You know exactly where that word of God is in your heart and where to go get it when you need it. Right? Think of Pirates of the Caribbean. They've treasured stuff. They know where the map is. They know how to get what they want. And so, I have treasured your word in my heart. You know that word treasured is the same word that's used in Exodus chapter 2 about a young girl who becomes pregnant, has a baby, and uh, the, uh, the Egyptians are killing all the babies. And she takes little baby Moses and she hides him among the reeds. That's the same word here that we hide the word of the Lord in our heart. It wasn't like she just abandoned him. She hid him hoping nobody would find him. She knew it was in her mind where that baby was all the time. That's the same thing that we should do with the word of God in our hearts. I wrote some things on the back of this piece of paper. Not yet. I'll get to that. So what's the goal? Why would we hide something in our heart? The second half of the verse says, so that I don't sin against you. 
I have hidden your word in my heart so that I don't sin against you. And to me, my first question is, what is purity? Who determines if the room is clean? God does. And it says right here that I might not sin against you. That's purity. To live a life that God wants for you and not sinning against God is a life of purity. That's our ultimate goal in the Christian walk, isn't it? To live a life worthy of God? Purity is not sinning against God. So how do we get there? By hiding His Word in our heart. It's more than memorization, right? It's like making God's Word such a part of you that no one can ever take it away from you. Having it readily available in any situation. So I, I, this is when I wrote something on the back of the paper, just for you. I don't know if you've done this, but I've met people on the street, and if you talk to people much about your faith, they always come up with hard questions, and you're like, well, I'm not sure, let me go look it up. And I think part of hiding the word in your heart is having an answer ready for people through the Scripture. And so, when young people come to me and say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. Does God want me to do this or that? Or I'm not sure what God wants me to do. What's God's will in my life? I have a verse hidden in my heart that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. And so that's a verse that I have hidden in my heart that I use, that I know where it is when the question comes, what am I supposed to do? Right? How about somebody comes to you and says, Well, there is no God. God's not real. Do you have a verse hidden in your heart prepared to answer that question? I have a verse. It's not a very nice one. <laughs> In the book of Psalms it says, a fool in his heart says, there is no God. And so when somebody comes to me and says, there is no God, I'm not going to say, you're a fool. But in my mind, I'm thinking they're thinking foolishly, and I might say it to myself, a fool in their heart says there is no God. But I wouldn't be rude in a way to say that to them. But I try and have an answer. I hide these words in my heart so that when it comes up, it's time for me to bring that out. Right? How about anybody ever say to you, there are many paths to heaven? I heard that on the news just the other day. All paths lead to heaven. Well, I mean, does do all paths lead to Reading? <laughs> Get on Highway 101 and all paths lead to Reading. Is that true? <laughs> Oh, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Not all paths lead to heaven. And so what's your biblical answer? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's my verse that I've hidden in my heart so that when the time comes up, I'll have an answer. I wrote a couple other examples down. The Bible's just a book full of names and lists and things that I don't understand. And the Bible's old. And I, I automatically, as some of you Awana people out there, right? What's the Awana verse? Uh, a, uh, come on, somebody help me. A workman, a, a proved workman, needs not be ashamed, right? Accurately handling the Word of God. And to me, that goes right along with the other part of 2 Timothy that says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. How? I don't know. Sometimes there are parts of the Bible when you look through a genealogy and it's like, how does this work? My dad and I had a conversation the other day about Methuselah. And we found out looking in the Bible that Methuselah and Noah were related. And if they hadn't put those boring lists of people's names in there, we would have never been able to put that all together. So those lists are important. But it says all Scripture is useful. Even the parts you find boring. Even the parts that we don't understand. All Scripture is useful. So that's part of why I bring this up because I want you to hide God's word in your heart because that's what's going to help you to not sin against him. All right? All right. I'm going to go back to my original question as I get ready to close here. My advice for someone who's interested in missions is this. Become a man or woman of purity today. Here at home, don't wait until tomorrow. Begin living a godly life today. The Bible says, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. So yes, God called me to missions many years ago. And like I said earlier, Janine and I spent 10 years preparing to go to Bolivia. We went to language school, we end up in Bolivia, paid off school loans, raised support, we learned language, and then God determined our steps differently than I ever thought. 
And if I hadn't worked from the very beginning on my character and on following God and on purity, I would not be where I am today. And I think as you begin to walk down through God's plan in your life, maybe he's calling you to missions and you go off to YWAM and you go off to do your DTS. Who knows? Maybe a month later, God's going to determine that he wants you over here. And so God wants us to obey him one step at a time. And we might have an idea, a plan of where we want to get in the end. But you don't know. You and I have no clue where God will eventually bring us. I had no idea. To be honest with you, when I started volunteering for Teen Challenge, I didn't know what Teen Challenge was. Never been a part of it. Never been, I'll be honest with you, never been a part of a recovery program before. Um, but I love the Lord and I love people. And God used me and put me in a position that I would have never dreamed in a million years, even in the last seven years that God would have me here today. But all part of that is all part of God's plan. And I can look back in my life and say, God knew exactly what he's doing all along the way. And so I would encourage you that as you begin uh, your call to missions, or maybe you're 20 years into your call to missions, be open to what God has for you, because he's going to surprise you. I, I remember, Pastor Dennis, when you first applied uh, was as a candidate here, you weren't really looking for a, a new pastorate position, were you? I kind of remember the story a little bit that it was... This wasn't part of your original plan, that you were going to be a senior pastor of Arcata First Baptist, but God had that in His plan. And I think that's true for all of us. And as, as we obey each step of the way, God will determine it. You know, I love the verse... Um, that uh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Have you ever been out in the pitch dark with a lamp? How far does a lamp shine? About two feet. About two feet. And God's word is a lamp. And that's all it is. He just wants you to take one more step. He, it's not like a, these new halogen headlights that blind you on the freeway. It's a lamp. You don't know what's 200 yards ahead. You know what's about two feet ahead. And God says, just take the next step. Trust me. You want me to volunteer at Teen Challenge? I don't even know what that is. Just trust me. All right. Okay. You want me to teach Bible classes? Okay. I don't know what God has for you. You're holding your own lamp. God, I can't see your path here. You have to hold your own lamp. And the lamp is the Word of God. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet. You want to know what your next step is, young men and women? Get the Word out. And God will reveal to you what He has for you. One step at a time. Maybe God will bless you. He didn't bless me this way in t telling me what's going to happen 10 or 20 years from today. I don't know. Maybe God's given you that word. He hasn't given it to me. And so what we have to do is just one step at a time. Living a life of purity prepares you for whatever God's next step is for you. Be prepared for the next step. And so I wrote this down, and I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, I wrote, work on your foundation. And then Jeremy led us in a song this morning about how firm a foundation. And I was thinking about my old Bible. I think the date in it says uh, 1904. Right? And I was thinking of dates, and then the words to how firm a foundation came up, and it said it was written uh, by, was it John Rippon? I think that was his name. Did anybody notice the date on that hymn? It was like 1700s. It says 17, I wrote it down because I was so like, 1794, it doesn't matter what year it was. 1787, that was written, and we're, did you get it over here? Peter got it. But 1787, and this was the words. I'm going to finish with just two final thoughts. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. We all sang that this morning, and I didn't even hear the words. I saw it up there, and I'm like... That's exactly what I'm talking about today, is that your foundation and mine has to be on the Word, is laid for your faith in His excellent Word. From 1700 and, what was that Peter? 87. I, I did write it down here. So here's my question, I'm going to go back to the very beginning. How can a young man keep his or her way pure? One, by living according to the Word of God. Two, by seeking God with all your heart. By three, by not wandering 
and by four, by hiding his word in your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for your call on each and every one of our lives. I'm thankful for this church that loves you and loves to spread your word throughout the world. I just pray a blessing on each person here today on this missions conference that's kicking off. And I just pray that you would do great things around the world through the people here today. I pray that you would encourage those who are going, protect them, guide them. You can provide financially for anybody. And so I pray anyone struggling with finances today, uh, trying to go on a missions trip and they just aren't sure how they're going to pay for it. I just pray in a miraculous way you would provide every penny. Lord, you are good and you are worthy of our service. And I just pray this morning that we would just love you with our whole heart and seek you with our whole heart in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Let's thank Tom and in a song, and if you need uh, prayer for anything, uh, I'm going to call the elders and the prayer team to come forward, and we'd love to pray over you and pray for you, and so just feel free to come and have one of these uh, prayer servants uh, uh, pray with you uh, in regard to your needs, whatever it might be. And should you be here today and you don't know of this great, wonderful Savior that we've been talking about all morning, he loves you so much. Scripture says that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have the birth of last in his life. And we just want to uh, let you know that God loves you so much. And Jesus loves you. He came and gave his life for you, for me, so that as we believe in him, our sins might be forgiven that he would fill us with the Holy Spirit and he would give us a future and a hope. What you've heard today is testimony of the future and hope that God gives. And so if you've never made that step of faith, I want to encourage you to come up and uh, ask one of these uh, persons to pray with you and so that you too might begin your journey. switch things up. We're not going to do this last song here. We're going to change it up. So, Christine, don't worry about the slides for this last song. <laughs> so hopefully everyone knows it. It's I have decided to follow Jesus. And that's pretty much all the words, but we'll call it out as we go. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided
we just thank you for who you are God we thank you for what you've done for us and you've paved the way for us Lord you've done all the work we just really have to accept you and follow you Lord and so I pray you'd help us to do that Lord to to listen to your voice today to to look to you for for what's right and wrong God to look to you for direction and everything Lord we just we thank you that you are good we can depend on you Lord that you don't change thank you that you love us and you really do want what's best for us thank you father just thank you that you love us Lord I pray that we would really know that and um that we would see you this week, Lord, that we would look for you, that we would listen to you and obey you this week, Lord. I just pray for your strength to do that because we, uh, we really need your strength to, to stay out of those bad ruts, Lord, and to make good ones. Um, so I pray you'd help us, Lord. pray you'd bless everyone here and everyone listening and just bless, yeah, bless our week, God. Go with us and show us your love. pray in Jesus' name. Say amen. 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 Have a good week. Mm -hmm.